You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have May Cobb on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Hunting Wives. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I, this book gave me so much joy uh, to read. And, and that's not something that you get to say uh, you know, about a lot of thrillers, but it had me laughing. It had me on the edge of my seat. Um, what a fantastic book. This is a definite must-have for your summer reading for sure. Uh, welcome to the show, May. Thank you, Hank. That's so nice to hear, and um, thanks for having me on. Well, I'm so excited to have you. Um, May we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? It would have to be in the fourth grade. I was at um, a university interscholastic league competition for creative writing, if anyone knows what that is. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. And um, I wrote a very predictable short story that at the end you find out it's a dream. (laughs) (laughs) But it actually won. And I was so happy. I was so happy it won. And then I was so happy because my parents were separated at the time. But for the award ceremony, we went to Steak and Ale. And it was like a very parent trappish evening where... (laughs) Oh, are they going to get back together? So I wanted to be a writer then because it was it was going to make some magic happen. <laughs> so I have to ask you that story uh, that ends up being a dream at the end. Uh, was Bobby Ewing involved at all? <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure he was because that's what I did. You know, in the '80s, was <laughs> watch Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because my wife and I have been rewatching uh, the the old eighties Dallas uh, reruns on Amazon Prime. That was that was one of the things that we did during uh, lockdown. Don't judge us; it just it happened. No, uh, it's it, fabulous, isn't it? Dallas is amazing. Oh, uh, it's you know, yeah. It, it, there there were some great story aspects, and then some also some things that made you cringe. And oh, you know, yeah. it's, it was it was a great experience though. Um, we're we actually have like a a season and a half left, I think, but we're we're kind of dragging it out because you know when you don't want something to end and. It's a uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, I got a lot of mileage out of who shot Jr. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I I remember as a kid people wearing the t-shirts and stuff. Yeah. Like it was yeah. a it was a real cultural phenomenon. It was it was it was brilliant. Yeah, and and really really reminded you of what life was like before the internet and you know before the rumor mills could just heat up as quickly as they do now. It was. It was really an interesting look back at a time that's that that might be forever lost. Yeah, I think it is, but I I love that time. Absolutely. Nostalgia loves it. Yeah. So so what do you remember anything about the story that you wrote? What like were you pulling from an inspiration or you know did this just come out of nowhere? What can you can you remember back to the creative process that, that was around you writing that story? Are you talking about the one in the fourth grade? Yeah, the one in the fourth like, grade. I, the one I wrote a hundred years ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great question. I don't remember anything other than like writing it sort of in a fever and then knowing like, oh, this is gonna be a dream. And then later as an adult, I'm like, that was such a predictable thing, and I'm so shocked that it won. I don't remember what the story was about. I really wish I did. I still have my little wooden plaque, though. It's hanging up in my closet because uh, <laughs> that's that's how I can call myself an award-winning author, right? So um... I love it, love it. <laughs> so May, did uh, were you a bookish kid? Were you you know one of those girls that walked around with her nose in a book? Absolutely, I loved like. Um, Nancy Drew. I had that whole collection. I loved me some Sweet Valley High. Um, That was such a fun read. And then um, 
Yeah, I, I really have always loved reading. And it's funny, I, I think like through school, you don't really know that writing can be a career path or anything. So I, I sort of had a vague notion that I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I realized that I could never pass like the LSAT or whatever test that is. So I <laughs> I became an English major. And um, anyway, but yeah, I guess I've always been kind of drawn, like I was always scribbling in a diary about melodramatic stuff. Um, so yeah, I think I was always, it was always in me. Did you, uh, did you grow up in a family of storytellers by any chance? Yeah, my mom is just a phenomenal storyteller, and uh, she just puts the rest of us to shame. She is hilarious and dry and brilliant. Um, she actually gave me the inspiration for, well, my first novel and also for The Hunting Lives. So I'm like, all right, mom, what else you got? I'm ready for another <laughs> idea. <laughs> Is that an East Texas accent that I'm picking up? Yes, you have a Texas accent too, right? I'm I'm in South Mississippi, so we're we're okay. not too far apart. Right, this, we're this little thing called Louisiana is between us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very East Texas. I'm from Longview, Texas, which is kind of by Shreveport. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly where you're talking about. So. Uh, being from from East Texas and and being from the South in in general, um, do you do you feel like that a, a sense of place uh, seeps into your writing? Now, now the hunting wives, you know, it is is obviously um, you're pulling on on your sense of place there because of the setting. But do you feel like that that East Texas or the the way you were brought up or the place that you were brought up? Um, has an effect on the types of stories that you tell or or seeps into the style of storytelling that you do? Absolutely. It's such a central part of it's it's like not only the backdrop, but almost the character. I so the you know, the town in East Texas I'm from is situated in the midst of like this very lush bucolic pine forest and um my first novel, Big Woods, is set there, and then The Hunting Lives is set there, and I I find it to be for thriller writing, like a very sort of Southern Gothic noir type setting, whereas the rest of Texas may not call to me as much. Like I'm in Austin now and it's, yeah, there's, yeah, it's just kind of happy people everywhere here. So it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, or they're acting like they're happy, but uh, not sure they're happy. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so I'm very much called to write about that forest, those woods, that that sort of, you know, the 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 hot, humid summers of the South. It, it's definitely like um, I don't think I can set my novels anyplace else. I don't want to anyway. Yeah. Well, speaking of that whole Southern War uh, kind of feeling, um, I, I've I've asked a number of writers this who uh, people that write Southern literature, and I'm making. Uh, air quotes with my fingers here. Um, <laughs> and and even if it's not classified Southern literature, that there is something about stories set in the the Deep South, especially. Um, what do you think it is about this area? Um, you know, because I I don't know of uh, of a particular genre that gets named after Iowa or um, you know the New England per se. Um, but there is something about the South and and it almost becomes a genre of its own in a in a weird way. What do you think it is about that? I think it's um I don't I don't know if there's one answer, but if I had to guess what I would say is I just feel like the south is almost mythic and it's there's something that feels very ancient about it and I there are some larger than life characters walking around <laughs> sure. the South and it just, I don't know. There's also a very eerie beautifulness about it too. And a lot of it's also untouched and untapped. I feel like, I feel like there's, you know, we've read so many novels that are set in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, you know, the urban places. And then the South is still in some ways like this very mysterious place. Absolutely. Um, your your first book that you wrote, uh, Big Woods, you, you mentioned earlier, um, 
what was uh, what were you doing in your life before Big Woods came along? What um, you know, I know from the fourth grade on, you you knew that there was uh, that you were a storyteller, and this was something that you were going to do one day. But you know, this little thing called life gets in the way a lot of times, and you know, you you start you know paying bills and and raising a family and all that good stuff. Um, how does Big Woods kind of it, interfere with your life to the point that it becomes a thing yeah it was it was interesting I started really writing about 25 years ago because I came across this story of this phenomenal jazz musician and I became sort of like a super fan obsessed with him and he died on my fourth birthday so I never got to meet him but he was his name was Rossan Roland Kirk and he was blind and he could play three saxophones at the same time and he was just this unbelievable person with this iron will. And I was sort of really led to try to write his story. And I'm still working on it. I'm almost finished with that project. But um, life does get in the way. And I've, you know, I sort of followed a different, you know, like I've, I've worked a lot of different odd jobs. And um, my son is now eight years old. And, you know, just life really does have a way of, of getting in the way of what you want to do the most sometimes. So I tried to get very serious about my writing and I took a class from the novelist, Amanda Air Ward, who's one of my favorite writers. She's in Austin too. And I was taking it to try to help me figure out the structure of the jazz book. And through taking it, I realized, wow, I really want to write fiction. She makes it sound so interesting and she kind of breaks it down into manageable steps. So long story short, I, just found that I really loved, I had moved back to Longview and was living in East Texas with my husband and my son then was two. And uh, the woods just really haunted me up there. And Big Woods just kind of came out of that. And it's, it's set in the 1980s during the satanic panic. And it, it follows a, uh, a young girl whose sister has gone missing and everyone believes she's dead, except for the sister who keeps having these dreams about her. So um, yeah, that kind of led me to, through writing that, I realized I, I really do love writing fiction, specifically thrillers. And I, uh, I was, after that came out, cause that was with a really small press and the press has now gone under, it got, you know, it, it won some awards and got well reviewed, but I certainly, um, was struggling to make a living at it. So the hunting wise was like my last roll of the dice as to whether or not I could, you know, you know, make this a career path. And, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. Right. But it, um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm grateful for Berkeley who's publishing it because they've been such a wonderfully supportive home for it. And that was a very long winded answer to a question. That no, that was, that was a perfect answer. Um, but may would, um, what drew you to thrillers? Because you've, you published two books, big woods and now the hunting wives, they're both thrillers. Um, was was that just the 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 default genre that when you started thinking of stories it it was going to have to be this sort of story what what was it that that draws you to thrillers do you think yeah it really was um it was really the explosion of gone girl and girl on a train yeah those two books sort of when they came out i hadn't quite read anything like those and i loved them so much i loved the pacing the propulsiveness I love the wicked character in Gone Girl, <laughs> and I loved the not so likable character of Girl on a Train, and it just it really inspired me to want to write, um, you know, like a mystery. And then I found that it's yeah, suspense and thrillers. That's sort of my jam. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden 
writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Was Big Woods the, the first book that you'd ever written? Uh, you know, a lot of people will have a, a trunk novel or one that they can practice on. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the, the first thing you write is is good enough. Um, was Was Big Woods your first book? Yeah, Big Woods was my first novel. Um, I had been working on the nonfiction book in a lot of different um, like evolutions of it, but it, since it's nonfiction, it's it was different. And I I have some rough drafts of that like from early on before I figured out how I wanted to tell that story. But Big Woods was my first novel, and um, yeah, it's I I. I I feel like my ego is too fragile that if it hadn't gotten accepted for publication, I would have not <laughs> kept doing this. So um, I'm glad that it did find a home. And uh, I got to work with a wonderful editor there at Midnight Inc. I was really sad to see them shudder. Um, it was a great experience. So yeah, it was it was my first one. And like I said, if if it if it remained in my drawer, I probably would not still be writing because that's just how I roll. So from big woods and uh, a, a story surrounding the satanic panic of the eighties and, and um, going now to the hunting wives, um, th- this book feels like it's a, a completely different tone uh, from the first book. Um, do you remember the, the first moment that the hunting wives was born uh, for you, you know, it's I, I'm fascinated with where stories begin, because one moment it, the hunting wives doesn't exist in any form. And then either you're thinking, uh, you know, about a character that walks on the stage of your mind or you're thinking about a, a plot device. You know, what if you start playing the what if game in, in your mind and then, in, you know, then the story is born and then it, it may take several months to unearth the story and, and write it down. But it it exists in some fashion. Do you remember that first moment that the story was born? I do. And this is such a great question. Um, I was actually visiting East Texas and uh, visiting my mom and um, the the phenomenal storyteller that she is. And uh, we were driving around on the backcountry roads and she starts to tell me about how when she was in high school there in the 60s, there was something called the hunting party. 
And it was basically just like rich guys, rich popular guys that would go out on the weekends and sit on the hoods of their giant cars and shoot at like rabbits and small animals. And she went out there once and was like, ooh, I didn't know this what this was gonna be. And but as she was telling me that, I just got a real clear image of these teens out in the woods with guns on a Friday night. And I thought, oh, that could go wrong like a thousand <laughs> different ways. Right. <laughs> So that's how that was born. So the the book is um, uh, it, it's set uh, around Austin, right? It's set. It's actually set in a fictionalized town, okay, Mapleton, which is really just a thinly veiled version of Longview, Texas. So it's, okay. it's in Northeast Texas. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, when when you start thinking about you know that that story and the um the thing that your mother told you um what were some of the what was the process that you went through to start you know um playing the what ifs and uh you know taking this thing that existed and morphing it over to the story how how did you start thinking through um you know what the story would become that's such a great question, too, because I really do like to play the what if game. I do, um, too. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best prompt, really, because it it asks a question instead of giving an answer. And um, so for me, she told me that I, I guess it was probably in the summer. And then uh, my, my my Big Woods novel came out like the following summer. And in between that time, I knew it was time to really start working in earnest on a book. And I was, uh, I was pretty blocked, honestly, like, gosh, I, you know, really just, you know, economically. Um, and what, you know, and my husband said, well, you better write something. And so <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I will. And, uh, so what I did was I basically sat down and, and I wrote a one page synopsis of what I thought the overview of the novel was. And I didn't know a lot other than I knew I wanted to write a novel of obsession and a life going off the rails. And I knew I wanted to make it like an all female elite shooting club. So I had that. And then what you say about the what if it was like, OK, so what if this main character, Sophie, follows her? deepest desires instead of repressing them. And I wanted to sort of trail her descent into obsession. So I think I, I think I opened up the word document as we do and um, wrote like a little opening and I was like, Oh, I can't do this yet. And so I was still blocked for a few months. And then during the launch of big woods, I was like, I have got to sit down and do this. So I, I basically spent four months writing up like the first half a partial um, so I could take around to agents because I had parted ways with my old agent and um, I was, you know, in between agents and books and, and it kind of came out pretty fast because um, desperation can be a very good motivating <laughs> factor. <laughs> and yeah, that was kind of my messy process. So I, I, I don't know too much from the outset. I really do like that. What if question? And I just tried to follow Sophie through her journey with these crazy women. So Sophie is a transplant from Chicago that, that winds up in, in Texas. And um, then, you know, she, she meets Margot and, and, you know, the, the story kind of barrels forward from there. Um, but how important was it for you, for Sophie to be a transplant uh, of sorts, to, to not be, a native of the area, but be someone from the outside that's now coming into to this, you know, crazy thing. I I think it was kind of crucial because she needed to definitely be an outsider and I wanted her to be sort of a, a conduit for the reader, you know, stepping into this very specific, peculiar world and discovering it with fresh eyes instead of like, oh, I lived there my whole life and I know these crazy women, but now I'm going to hang out with them. Instead, it was like, it kind of helped to add like a built-in layer of suspense because she's getting to know them for the first time, like the reader is. Right. So tell me about Margot um, as as a great contrast, um, you know, because when when you're a storyteller, you look for contrast for for things to to play against each other. And Margot is a 
is a, a perfect contrast for for Sophie. Um, where did she come from, and what role does she play? Thank you so much for saying that. She um, she kind of came out of the ether, honestly. And I mean, I would say that if you visited Longview, Texas, you might bump into certain types of women like her. So um, <laughs> uh, she she probably exists somewhere, but she's a work of pure fiction. But um, I, I knew that I wanted to to do like a, a deep dive into toxic female friendships. So I knew that there was probably going to be a ringleader, an alpha female, you know, leading the charge. And that was Margot. And yeah, she just sort of, she came out of the ether and I found her to be kind of intoxicating to write and also unsettling and a total mystery. So I wanted to know what was making her tick and what's going on behind those, you know, uh, Prada sunglasses. And, um, yeah, that's how Margo kind of came about. And, uh, she is kind of a good counterpoint to Sophie and she's definitely, she's really in charge of the whole group. I mean, they all sort of fall under her sway. Right. You know, there's, there's something funny that um, that happens, uh, May, when when you read a story about a place and it's written by a person that that obviously uh, is not familiar with the place. They they just picked it on a map and 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 they don't understand all of the intricacies that that give a place its character. And um, it, you know, very quickly it can uh, devolve into. Uh, stereotypes and 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 stereotypes are are okay, I guess, in, in a way that um, you know they 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 kind of point to the obvious things about a place. But if you're not familiar with what makes the stereotype work, it it becomes just um, cliche and caricature uh, yeah. almost. Um, what uh, what were some of the things that that you you know in in being a a, a native uh, someone who kind of understands the culture um, that that's when it becomes fun to play with those stereotypes because you can kind of poke at the things that are that are obviously funny and you know that that other people don't understand but but you get to do it with the 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 sense of you know I'm one of them therefore I can make fun of it um it if that makes sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What What were some of those things that that were fun for you to play with? I mean, I think probably the most fun, was, and and I hope this isn't offensive to anyone. I don't mean any offense by it, but just sort of like the um, sort of the very like right wing Christian zealotness of the area, and how people have like, you know, a lot of. Uh, the, the, the people are always trying to sort of like bring Sophie to church and convert her and they're very extroverted and, and pushy about it. Um, Cause that, that's kind of a thing there. Everyone's kind of always out to save people um, even if right. they have for it. So, so uh, yeah, I mean that, and then just, I, I guess. Well, and I, whether you believe it or not, it's part of the culture. It's, it is. It, it's not even a religious thing. It's a cultural thing more than it, anything. Right, exactly, exactly. And um, and then also I just loved, you know, I just kind of loved playing around with the the sort of like these debutante women who, you know, on the outside, you might pass them in a supermarket and think, oh, those are just trophy wives. They don't have much agency. There's not a lot going on behind their big hair and their, you know, BMW. But in fact, these women are quite powerful, ruthless, cunning they're running the show. Their husbands aren't the ones going out on hunting weekends. They are. Um, that was kind of fun to play with because I do feel like <laughs> that's how the women in this town and sort of in the South are. They are they are not messing around, even if it's Bridge Club. Like, they know where to bury the body and who to help them <laughs> bury the body with <laughs> <laughs> well, go go to a soccer game or a softball game or whatever on a Saturday morning, and you you understand pretty quickly, you know, where the power dynamics are. <laughs> exactly, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, so May, as you as you started thinking through this, uh, you know, there's there's obviously a mystery, um, at the at the core of 
the story here. Um, can you walk through just, you know, how did you decide what sort of trouble to put these these, you know, four dimensional characters into and 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 how did you start kind of running that out? Yeah, I just um, I once again, I did not do a lot of plotting, so it was very much organic and I knew that there obviously had to be a corpse at some point and then it kind of became clear to me who was going to die, but I didn't know who the killer was until, you know, um, about halfway through. So, yeah, there's I just kind of run through the forest at night <laughs> with this stuff. So do you consider yourself more of a pantser than than a plotter? Uh, you know, Absolutely, 100%. I love it. Love. Yeah. You know, people um, are, are very opinionated about, you know, which camp is the better camp to be in. But um, do, do, you, uh, do you ever, you know, like when you started writing the story, did you have any idea how it was going to end? Uh, sometimes we know the end from the beginning. We just don't know how we're going to get there. Um, but did you know what the ending was going to be? I did not. I had no idea. <laughs> None at all. <laughs> the Hunting Wives is available everywhere now. When you're hearing this, you can grab it in Kindle edition, a hardcover, or audiobook. Um, go, go. There's links to it in the show notes of the episode. Uh, May is, uh, If people want to dig into all the stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Yeah, I think the easiest is probably my website, which is www.maycobb.com, M-A-Y-C-O-B-B.com. And then it has my little like social media links because I'm like every other writer, I'm on social media all day long instead of writing. So that's where y'all can find me. <laughs> Excellent. We'll put links to all those places in the show notes of this episode. May, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. I really appreciate it. I'll see you. I'll see you around on the on the internet, I guess, for now until people can meet in person again. Absolutely. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.